throughout this whole course, we are going to teach you how to do sequence analysis, um, high throughput sequence analysis. So let's revisit high throughput or sequencing. Um, um, in the beginning of uh, 2001, this is right after the human genome sequencing was finished, um, or the draft genome was sequenced. If you look at a typical genome center, these are actually quite big genome centers. Um, usually you have a huge room like this of uh, equipment and uh, you know, about 35 scientists working together to prepare a sample. Um, in, in three to four weeks, they will be able to prepare enough samples to be put onto the sequencing machine. Then there is another room also very big with uh, 74 of these uh, capillary sequencers. Uh, and this is the sequencer that I you know, was kind of using when I was in college. And usually this, uh, these 74 machines will be run by 10 people and uh, a big genome center can run about 15 to 40 runs per day. And they can generate about, you know, each, each of this big sequencer can generate one to two megabyte of sequence per day at a total capacity of about 120 mega per day. And that's kind of the workforce for both the public and private efforts to finish the human genome project. And so for many years after that, people were using that approach to sequence a monkey genome or a dog genome, more uh, other species. Um, but then in 2007, a technique was invented called high throughput sequencing or second generation or next generation sequencing. Um, this is different in that we don't sequence one sequence at a time. We can sequence millions of sequences at the same time. And so for the previous genome center now can be really streamlined to a process like this. So with this one machine, um, one scientist could prepare the samples in a day for the DNA to be sequenced. And this, uh, for sequencing, you buy this machine. This is actually early days, uh, a genome analyzer. Um, this is from the same scientist. Um, after finishing the sample preparation, can load the DNA sample onto this a glass slide. You can see here, this is the size of a penny. So it's a very small slide. It can, um, the, you can load millions and millions of sequences onto this glass slide. And you put this in this machine and start to run and just kind of once in a while come and check, you know, check the, the run. Um, and so usually in three to five days, the run will finish. And this instrument can really output half a gigabyte of data per day per instrument, which is, you know, compared to 2001, it's an amazing um, progress in the technology. And Illumina was the market leader in this. And if you look at genome sequencing now or sequencing technology now, Illumina is still the market leader. And I love to uh, present this every year to look at, you know, the updates from Illumina website. And so they now have a suite of high throughput sequencing machines. There are, you know, the mini ones, um, which usually individual labs can buy. It doesn't generate as much sequence, but still it's quite impressive. And so each run you can see can take, you know, a few hours to a day, which can generate, you know, gigabytes of data. Um, and in millions, you know, like four to 20 millions of reads, uh, each read is uh, a, usually 150 base pair long, and you can have uh, bigger machines, which you can run from small core facilities here, um, which runs for you know two days or three days, um, and it can generate you know hundreds gigabyte of data and up to a billion uh, reads per run um, at, at the, um, this read length. And at bigger core facilities or companies that run sequencing as a service. Um, so sometimes a lab would generate um, sequencing samples and then they send it to an outside company to be sequenced. And these Nova 6, 6000, you can see these machines can, can generate up to 
six terabyte of data and 20 billion reads in less than two days. Even thinking about this data and you know, like where to store and how to transfer this data is kind of mind boggling, right? Compared to how much people were sequencing in 2001, you can, you can imagine um, this is just one machine. And very often big genome centers or sequencing companies might have 20 of these machines and every uh, many universities also have uh, one of these machines in their big core facility and so the data that's generated it's it's humongous um, and so if you look at the cost of sequencing a human genome this is uh, 2001 when the first human genome was finished at that time sequencing one human genome would cost a hundred million dollars. It's um, actually the full human genome project at the time cost three billion dollars. But because the technology was improving, by the time 2001 sequencing that same genome would have cost um, 100 million. And initially this was kind of a small price decrease, but it was kind of decreasing because the technology was improving until about 2007 when high throughput sequencing came around. Instead of sequencing one DNA stretch at a time, you can sequence millions at a time. And the costs suddenly started to decrease much, much faster. It's even faster than Moore's law. So if, if you look at this line, this is the Moore's law um, in the semiconductor industry. This was used to develop, uh, to describe uh, the silicon chips that were used in computers, um, which dictates that every 18 months, the capacity of the chip would double and the price would be half of uh, before. And so uh, initially, with first generation sequencing, we were following the Moore's law, but with the high throughput sequencing, the price of sequencing a genome decreased really, really quickly. Um, I remember in 2007, 2008, one of my colleagues was asking me, I said, oh, I have a like really rich friend and he wants to sequence his genome. Should he do this? And you can see here at that time, it would cost about a million dollars to sequence his genome. I'm like, oh, nah, don't do it. It's too expensive. Um, and you know, at that time, even if they were to sequence their genome, the information, um, what they would learn, it's still kind of questionable. Uh, but you can see here uh, nowadays sequencing a genome costs less than a thousand dollars. Yeah, so now uh, this is a reality. If you want to sequence your genome, um, you can do it. It's not too expensive, right? And also because so many genomes are sequenced, and uh, now people are learning a lot more about this. Um, but you know, first of all, with all the data generated, we have to assemble the genome, identify the difference between this person's genome with that reference genome to see which positions are different. And through this, um, you can then try to figure out, you know, whether this person have a different trait. And so to, I, to do the assembly and also identify the differences, um, I want to show you one uh, algorithm that was published in 2018, where scientists were using deep neural networks to identify uh, SNP or indels, which are kind of small, uh, nucleotide or a few nucleotide differences between individuals. And these uh, SNPs or indels happen usually um, occur one in every thousand bases between um, every pair of human. Um, but then they could create quite different uh, uh, traits such as uh, intelligence, uh, height, uh, hair color or, you know, nose shape or whatever, you know, like many different um, traits. Um, and so this actually have very important implications when people have sequenced enough genomes and look at the genome sequence, they can say, aha, this piece of DNA is important for, uh, for hair color. This particular region is really important for a perfect pitch in music or intelligence or, or height or, or things like that. And also um, probably more important, if you can identify specific region of the genome, which is responsible for a disease susceptibility, such as uh, likelihoods to develop cancer, 
Um, so we probably know that Angelina Jolie carries such uh, a mutation or a, a specific DNA in her genome, which made her more susceptible to breast cancer. And so she decided, you know, after she had kids, um, to have a preventative surgery uh, to remove her breast. This would drastically reduce her risk of developing breast cancer. And so you can see here, based on the genome sequencing, you could learn, you know, whether you are likely to develop a different disease. And um, based on this knowledge, you could um, pick a better lifestyle or have preventative procedures to reduce the risk for disease. There are also uh, high throughput approaches to do uh, disease diagnosis and also for drug treatment. Um, I want to mention this, uh, which is really already happening in major cancer hospitals. For example, at the Dana-Farber, if a patient is diagnosed with cancer, their tumor samples will be sequenced. We don't sequence their whole genome. Usually we just sequence about a few hundred genes that um, over the years have been uh, discovered to be frequently mutated. And there are also drugs that can potentially be used in order to treat cancers that have carry these mutations. Uh, and so these are called targeted therapies, which means that they only kill the cancer cells which carry the mutation, but will leave the normal cell intact, uh, which is quite fantastic because it would have less side effect than say uh, chemotherapy, which will just kill even your normal cells and have a lot of bad side effects. Um, yeah, so basically now every patient coming in will get their first tumor sequence uh, done. Um, at at Dana-Farber, this is actually done with philanthropy uh, for free to the patient. And based on the tumor uh, mutation profile, very often this patient would be given a specific drug based on that mutation to, to kill their cancer cells specifically. And sometimes this patient will also be matched to a clinical trial to be tested for a, a new drug, which might um, target one of these mutations. And so you can see here, with the cost of sequencing genomes reducing so quickly, um, you can then really have personalized disease pre prevention, um, diagnosis, and also personalized medicine or precision medicine to treat the disease based on the specific DNA sequence. Um, of course, this again generates huge amount of data and we are faced with big data challenges. And um, that's, that's kind of a big motivation for uh, biologists to learn more computational biology and also give a very interesting opportunity for computer scientists, for statisticians, for physicists, for uh, engineers to really uh, develop computational solutions to solve this big data challenge in biology and medicine.